Welcome to CISO's Insiders Podcast, powered by GRC Consulting. In this podcast, we'll be interviewing leading CISOs and security leaders in the industry for light, eye-level conversations. Here, they share advice and tips, talk about their biggest accomplishments and failures, favorite drinks, key influencers, and much more. We encourage you to walk away with at least one insight that will help you better yourself or your business. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more content, please check us out on social media. And welcome, everybody. Today, I'll be speaking to Rob Roser. Rob, looking at your uh, bio, you know, going back a couple of decades ago, I see that you've uh, started off in, in academia, moving into um, a company called Fermilab. And right now, I see that you're holding the position of the Chief Information Security Officer at the IDO National Laboratory. Uh, if you wanted to jump in and properly introduce yourself, because I'm not sure I did you justice, uh, that would be great. Sure. Good morning. Uh, my, uh, my background is mostly as a scientist. I have a PhD in experimental particle physics and spent 25 plus years at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory where I did a lot of different things from mostly in the scientific side, but also was the CIO at one point, ran their high performance computing at one point and, uh, and other things. And, and I, I've recently moved to Idaho National Laboratory to initially be their chief data scientist. And now also I run their cybersecurity program as well. Okay. So, I mean, uh, and we'll probably touch uh, more about that, but the, the transition from, uh, as, or I'm not sure if to call it a transition, but you're, we're in um, multiple hats right now, right? You're still a scientist, right. I'm, I'm assuming, but you're also the chief information security officer. How can you, like, do you, you think there's any any advantages in being a scientist first and then a chief information security officer? Well, I mean, I would say a couple of things. First, number one, you, you bring a different perspective to the job than uh, someone that goes through sort of a traditional process. And, and number two, a lot of cyber is actually understanding data. And uh, as a scientist, we're good at, at, at analyzing data and, and extracting its fullest value out of it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I guess we can dive right in. But before we do, I always like to ask a couple of icebreaker questions here. <laughs> okay. uh, if you're willing to share your marital status and your favorite drink, that would be great. Sure. My, um, uh, I am married to a wonderful woman named Lori, and we've been married for about 20, to 20 years, I guess. And my favorite drink, uh, if, it's, if we consider adult beverages, it's a well-made uh, bourbon Manhattan. Manhattan. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I don't think I've had that one, but I like bourbon <laughs> as well. I'm, I'm, I like bourbons, but I, I still prefer the single malt, the Scottish ones. Uh, I like single malt too. Yeah. Um, and you know, this question that I ask here, so, and typically this podcast is for our listeners to learn more about you and your career and your path to the, to the seat of the CISO, basically. And this question might uh, be different for you, but if there was one thing you wish you had known when you began your career, what would that be? Uh, well, I mean, I would say, first of all, it's, it's not, at least in my experience, it's not a career, right? I've had many different careers over the course of my, whatever, 30 or 35 years in, in the workforce. So, uh, so I would say a couple of things. Number one, don't be afraid to take risks. Don't overthink things, right? It's never gonna play out exactly as you imagine it to, to be, and that's okay. And then, and then I would say, go ahead and, and do things. When a problem arises at work and wherever you are, just volunteer to step up and do something. Pretty soon you'll get a reputation for getting things done and you'll be asked to do more and more things and gain responsibility quite quickly. So those are sort of the, the few things that I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And if there was one like big failure that you, that you can recall, what, what was it if you're able to share and what did you learn out of it? Wow, taking the gloves off right away. Uh, let's see. So, so I mean, the the, uh, the failure itself, I can certainly remember it, right? It was, uh, that was I was a scientist at, at Fermilab at the time. My role was to uh, 
to put together the infrastructure for this hundred million plus dollar experiment. And, and while, and we were trying to solve a, a technical problem and the problem itself, well, potentially interesting still to me is probably not to the listeners, so I won't describe it. But, but the bottom line is the failure was I let hubris get in the way of making the right decision. And, and, and I didn't listen to, to people. And so my takeaway, and, and, I, and I remind myself to, to this day, is I've learned at that point forward to speak less and to listen a lot more. Uh, and, you know, speaking about your, uh, big, your, your perceived big failure, what was your biggest accomplishment in your opinion? Uh, well, I don't know what biggest means, but, but the thing I'm potentially most proud of is, is as part of my career at Fermilab, I led an experiment called CDF, the Collider Detector at Fermilab. That a, a, was a team of about 700 scientists from around the world, 17 different countries, working together to solve a series of, of uh, interesting scientific challenges. And uh, actually, 10 years ago this week, we announced first evidence for the uh, so-called Higgs boson, the uh, what was nominally uh, referred to as the God particle, uh, which was quite a, a tour de force for an experiment of ours like ourselves. Can you elaborate just a bit about that? I know I'm it's uh, I'm out of my depth here, but uh, <laughs> I did sure. hear the, about Higgs boson in the past. Right. So so let, let, what it, the Higgs boson was a theoretical construct until 10 years ago. Which, the, uh, which we put together to basically understand how, ma- how different particles have mass. So why does a proton have a certain mass that's different than, let's say, uh, an electron or, or something else? And so the way it works is the following, is that let's say we're, we're at a party, you and I at a cocktail party since we started talking about drinks earlier and, and you and I walk in and, you know, nobody really knows us. And so nobody pays much attention to us. But if Joe Biden walked into the room, people's heads would turn and they pay attention. And so, so the, uh, the amount of charisma, if you will, or, or, or celebrity uh, can equate to mass. So, so that if you think of the, the room of the participants as your, your field, your Higgs field, if you will, and uh, and popularity being the the mass term, Joe Biden is more massive than we are because he's more popular, or at least more recognized. So that's that's the the construct of it, and it it it, it was a, a significant gap in in our theory of things. We knew well matter is made up of six quarks, up, down, strange, charm, top, and bottom. We knew each of them had a mass, but we didn't know why. We didn't know why the up quark uh, weighed uh, less than the top quark, for instance, or why the charm quark weighed a different amount. And so, so this allows us to explain it in a quite simple fashion. And that's what's nice about it. Mm-hmm. In fact, the, the 10th anniversary was yesterday, July 4th. We, we found first evidence on July 2nd. So we, we only had two wow. days of fame <laughs> before overtaken. <laughs> wow, okay. Impressive. Thank you for that. And, you know, trying to explain sure. very complicated things to me in a very simple manner. Uh, um, and so, and, and again, this, la- this next question might not be as, um, might not resonate as well with you, because as you mentioned, you had uh, multiple careers, but uh, the question goes like this, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Uh, well, I don't know if anyone has a career similar to mine, <laughs> but, but I would say first and foremost, start. Get a job in something related to the field that you're interested in. Even if it's not the perfect job for you, it's your, you can't have a career in a field if you don't have a job in the field. And so the, the first thing to do is just get in there somehow, whether it be as an intern or, or whatnot. And once you get inside the door, then you can start to maneuver and do things, talk to people and start to, uh, to create the career that suits your needs and, and, uh, and interests. Mm-hmm. And just to provide some more context to our listeners here, what would you say like the division of time for you between you know being a CISO and being a scientist? Like how much time each oh, one takes? I, well, so I probably spend 
70% of my time right now uh, worrying about cyber because it's such a complicated space right this second. And then 30% as the chief data scientist. So mm -hmm. uh, only be in, in there, I mean, uh, we're not making as progress as quickly as I would like on the science side, but, but we'll get there. Got it. And that division of time, that's been that way since you moved into the CISO seat? Yeah, more or less. I would say when I took, the reason I'm here in this, in this position is we had, there were challenges within the organization. There was a, a lack of trust and, uh, and, and communication wasn't there. And so they asked me to come in and, and reestablish that. And uh, basically as a, in an interim way, because I have a lot of experience in running large groups and big teams and, and I just stayed. So, mm -hmm. so that, so that, so, you know, as a, it, it sort of goes up and down depending on the problems we're solving and, and whatnot. And uh, I now uh, have a phenomenal team. And so I can, I can let them do a lot of it. And my job is essentially now to remove obstacles and sort of set a, a high level direction. Okay, thank you. And, and again, I, I'm not sure how your organization is structured, but uh, what would you feel about the role of, an I, of, the, of, uh, of a CISO that's actually a part of the IT organization? Yeah, so, so at, at Idaho National Lab, the, the, the cybersecurity is part of, of IT. I know the popular fad out there right now is that the CISO should be separate from the IT organization, but that, that's not us. Uh, so, so, you know, and I would say we have, or at least what I think of as a, as a quite traditional uh, cyber organization. So on my team, we have both classified uh, networks as well as unclassified networks. So I, uh, I run all of the classified systems. And then in the unclassified world, I have a team that handles policy, uh, training and awareness for, for phishing and that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then I have an operations, uh, an operations team that handles the architectures, the vulnerability scanning, and, and those sorts of things. And I have a security operations team. Mm -hmm. So, so, but I don't own everything, right? I don't. My team doesn't do the patching. My team doesn't manage the firewalls. My team doesn't uh, doesn't do some of the other tr traditional IT things. And the application developers are are not on my team either. So, so it's a it's a team effort in order to execute cyber. It's not just my team uh, if we're going to be successful. But do you feel there's any conflict of interest uh, between, you know, the being under the IT organization and then getting things done? Because other, I mean, obviously you have priorities, the IT has priorities, and those might come in conflict from time to time. Right. I mean, so that's the, that's the argument for why you move cyber outside of the IT organization. And, uh, and my response, because... Uh, I was asked that once here at, at Idaho, where do, do you think you should sit? And as long, I mean, it's all about relationships uh, and communication and trust. And uh, I uh, have a great relationship with my boss, who's the CIO. We talk constantly and, uh, and we, we, uh, we work it out. So I have no problems being set up the way, uh, the way it is right now. I mean, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be more effective outside if I didn't get along with them in the first place, because, you know, org charts can only get you so far. It's really the relationships on, that go, uh, you know, alongside those, those organization charts that actually uh, decides what gets done. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, communication is, uh, is, is key to, to everything at the end of the day. And, you know, you need to have a good relationships and, right. and a good working relationship with your peers and colleagues and even your managers. So actually, I had a follow-up question here. You know, in my experience working with other academic institutions in the past, uh, I've noticed that in some cases, the um, high-level positions like the C-level uh, um, uh, tier was uh, it, it was it was more beneficial when that individual held a PhD and was actually a part of this scientific community if, that, community, if that makes sense. Do you feel that's also the same in your organization or similar organization to yourself? Uh, so I can speak for my organization for sure. And, and that's absolutely, I think scientists have their own language, if you will. They're very precise with their words and words that scientists use uh, may map with a different meaning to non-scientists. And so, uh, so you can, so it, it certainly helps to 
to have sort of the street cred behind you when you're talking to them, you understand their world and what they're trying to accomplish and, 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 and how you can help them be successful and still be able to answer the mail, if you will, and make sure you can protect what needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And, and I think, uh, again, going back to my last question about the role of the CISO as part of the IT and the fact that you mentioned that, you know, it's all about the communication and trust. Uh, can I assume that maybe communication might not be as good as it is if you weren't like a, a scientist first and then a cybersecurity professional? I mean, well, since I can't do the Gedanken experiment to see how I would with and without it, it's it's hard to say. But I, I think it definitely helps in, with my ability to interact with the scientific and research staff to have, to have similar credentials to what they have. Okay, got it. Thank you. I forgot for a second that I was speaking to a scientist. And uh, <laughs> uh, okay, um, do you like in terms of resources? Like, yeah, I, and and I'm sure you you've noticed that you know cybersecurity uh, space is an evolving space, and you keep having all kinds of new challenges every day. What are the best resources that have helped you along the way? Uh, for for me, it's my team. I have now a phenomenal team. I mean, recall when I got into this game, I, I knew cybersecurity was one word, but that was pretty much it. And, uh, and over the course of the last, I now, I think, have a good grasp and, and know what I'm doing. And the reason I do is because, uh, because I ha I've put together a really solid team and I've listened to them and they've helped, helped teach me how to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And that team, was that like... Uh... Uh, is that comprised out of people out of the ac academia or is it like, uh, you know, people from within the system? Yeah, all within this, all within, well, I shouldn't say all, most within the system, but a few outsiders as well that I, I lean on. I mean, mm -hmm. my brother is the CIO at, at Berkshire Hathaway Specialty Insurance, and he's a, he, uh, he's been in this game a long time. And so whenever I have a real problem, I'll call him up and ask him for advice. Okay, got it. Is there any one common myth or, uh, about a profession that you wanted to debunk? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's myth so much, but the thing that frustrates me is, is the lack of awareness as to what we do. Everybody knows cybersecurity, but I think if you ask the average person on the street, what does the person that's involved in cybersecurity for some company, what do they do? I doubt they'd be able to answer. And, and as a result, that lack of awareness of what we do and why we do it uh, hurts in the sense that we don't have enough people entering the profession that we need right now. There's about a million more jobs posted in cybersecurity than there are qualified people to take them at the moment. So if I had one wish, it would be nice to have a, a something like a, a Big Bang Theory TV show but about cyber people. <laughs> <laughs> to sort of start to popularize it a little, if you will. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that would be challenging, but uh, to, to have that show, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. Uh, in your opinion, what are, and, and obviously security awareness is one of them, but what are the main concerns that CISOs nowadays have? Oh, gosh. I mean, so, so well, all over the place, right? Where to begin? Mm. Well, ransomware, certainly top of mind. Advanced persistent threat groups are out there and getting more and more sophisticated by the day. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has me very concerned. Right now, we they seem to haven't wanted to escalate. We don't actually know what a full-blown cyber war looks like, and I hope we don't, but uh, it's certainly lingering out there, potentially, uh, and, uh, and what the broader implications as this conflict develops are. And then, and then lastly, you know, managing our stakeholders that they actually have no idea what cybersecurity is and, and managing them effectively so that you continue to invest properly in what you need in order to protect the enterprise. Those are the things that are first and foremost on my mind right now. Yeah, and I think you tapped into something that might be even larger than that. Like the, you mentioned the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. Uh, I think it's it's larger than that in a sense of uh, you have regional pl powers, regional players like uh, countries even that when they decide they go after right. you know a private industry or even uh, an institution in in the academia, 
um, you know, you don't really stand a chance against the country. So I think there's also a disparity there. Oh, I agree. And it's been interesting to watch these, some of these, these, uh, these cyber organizations, the, the malicious ones, pick sides, if you will, yeah. where they're going to align themselves or not, mm-hmm. right? Some of them, Conti has been all over the place, for instance. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and that leads me to my next question. In your opinion, what are the areas that CISOs nowadays should be most focused on? Well, so, so what, what we're doing, so first and foremost is, uh, is understanding what your risk posture is and what your risk tolerance is. So, so only then can you then make good decisions about mm-hmm. other things. And, and then I would say, even though it's, I mean, we're moving at, well, as fast as we can, I don't want to say at light speed, but as fast as we can towards uh, the uh, implementing a zero trust model. With, with least privilege, if you will, because I think, you know, the the old concept of of building a moat around your organization and protecting it that way, just is 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 not really sustainable anymore. You really you have to assume the bad guys are you know, inside your networks, and you have to provision such that they have minimal access and you can detect them quickly. So that's where we're heading. Okay, thank you. And in your opinion, what are the most important skills that CISOs nowadays should have? Hmm. Well, first, you need to be able to speak business. You need to be able to have the language and the vocabulary necessary to, to talk to, to your stakeholders in, in an effective fashion. If you can't get them to understand in their language, you're, you're going to have a problem. Next, as I think I touched on a little earlier, you need to understand your risk posture and, and quantifying it, it'll make it obvious where, you're, uh, where you need to focus and what your priorities ought to be. A good BS meter helps because you're gonna be getting ideas from all sorts of people and all sorts of vendors all the time. We talked a lot about communication skills as being paramount and, and I, I completely agree. Uh, it helps to have a, a solid understanding of, of technology. And, and finally, and, and maybe, most importantly, a questioning attitude. Don't just assume, don't get arrogant or cocky that I've implemented this and that and I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm impenetrable, right? Always, always ask the hard questions, always sort of even just play devil's advocate just to test yourself and test your team, if you will. Yeah, and a follow-up question on that. So in your opinion, were there any transferable skills, you know, from being a scientist to being a CISO? And I know you've mentioned, uh, you know, the ability to look at data uh, is one, I'm assuming, but do you, do you feel there were other uh, transferable skills? Well, so I come from a field called particle physics or high energy physics. And so those are, are big experiments, big collaborations, nowadays upwards of, of a thousand or more people. And, uh, and managing those kind of enterprises is, is like herding cats. And, and so, so the skills that you learn are, are those of how to foster uh, agreement, if you will, without, without just dictating, how to, how to build consensus, how to work with people, how to convince people that even though they may not want, want to do a job X, Y, or Z, or or do something that in the long term, it's in both their best interest and the enterprise's best interest. It's those kinds of things that that I play back, I call call back on quite often in doing this kind of a role. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And in your opinion, looking at the industry and where it's going right now, and I know you've mentioned like, uh, you know, the shortage of uh, at least 1 million positions in the U.S. alone. Uh, where do you think the CISO role is going? Looking like five, 10 years into the future. Yeah, so that, I mean, <laughs> I, I wish I knew. I mean, as we, I think you pointed out or you asked me earlier, certainly that the, it's trendy to move the CISO out of the IT organization so that to, to remove that potential conflict of interest, if you will. Whether that really happens or not, I mean, it, it, it takes a, a broader hold, uh, it I, remains to be seen. Because again, I think it can be worked either way. It's just a matter, it's a matter of personalities and, and, and good communication. I think broader or longer term, I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna see, increasingly see the CISOs, at least in, the, in corporate America, uh, have a seat up at the board because the stakes are so high and uh, 
and they'll need to to learn how to manage the boards and uh, how and be, I mean as we're now doing digital business for the most part and so protecting the enterprise digital assets and its intellectual property is paramount and uh, and it's I think the recognition of what happens when you don't do that uh, is 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 gaining is gaining ground if you will I think. The, the biggest transfer of knowledge in the course of history is probably in the last decade as, as cyber criminals have gotten in and, and, and stolen IP from, from corporate America. Yeah, and, and I think it started to happen already. So a lot of organizations, that shoot, you, I mean, most in, in corporate America, you see CISOs that have a board seat. But yeah, I think ah, okay. that, that trend is, is, is growing as well. Um, and personally, I think there's a huge difference between a large organization and and an SMB or like smaller companies in the tech space. I think for that sector, Caesar role will be looking different in the in the coming years. To be honest, uh, especially now with the impending uh, whatever you want to call it recession or right whatever it turns out to be, <laughs> um, and. Okay, and in your opinion, what will we see in the in our space next in the cybersecurity world next in terms of whatever innovation, products, uh, solution, services? Well, uh, here's my wish list. I have I have two things that that I would like to see. Number one, the ability to uh, to identify malicious traffic from trusted sources. Essentially, the whole Solar Winds event that occurred, what, 18 months or so ago, caught everybody off guard. And uh, and that's hard, right? It's hard to identify low level traffic coming from one of your own pieces of software that you downloaded uh, that's beaconing out and doing, and basically getting ready to, or, or, or doing or doing harm to an organization. So, so the AI tools have to get better and we have to get better at, at sort of uh, our logging capabilities so that what we're logging isn't noise, but is meaningful data, if, if you will. So that's one, that that capability or that ability, which uh, I don't think anybody does well right now. And then number two is, is I mean, the, the cloud is still in many ways the wild west. And, uh, and we don't at least have great visibility in cyber in the cloud. There's no standards for logging in the cloud. And so every cloud application and every Thing is sort of a one-off, if you will, and if so, we could start to create standards or or translators, if you will, so that you can move from cloud to cloud and and, uh, and have a consistent cyber capability or or monitoring ability. That would be that would be great. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, to standardize, you know, the cloud and login capabilities yeah. and requirements. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, where we go next, and and and. And as it translates into budget planning, have you seen any huge differences between, let's say, 2019 to 2020? I mean, 2019, 2020 to 21, 2022, when planning uh, the budget? So, well, yes, yes and no. I mean, I think, remember, I'm in federal space, and so our budgets are planned two years out. So it's a little bit complicated. We've gotten barrage this year by various compliance activities from the president's executive order on cybersecurity to a, a number of binding operational directives, all of which are unfunded mandates, if you will. So you, we're starting to see money grow in, in the space. I think there's an increased awareness of the importance of cybersecurity, uh, not only awareness, but recognition that, that in the, within the US federal government that in order to improve uh, the cyber posture across federal space, uh, it's going to require investments and strategic initiatives. And, and so I, I am expecting the budgets to continue to grow as, as we take on these challenges. Mm -hmm. And we need, the, we need also to catch up. We, we, at least we have collectively done a very good job, I think, in the IT space. But uh, the OT space is still lacking, and, uh, and we need to, uh, to catch up there. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, and what would you define as innovation in, in, in your space? Is it more along the lines of like, uh, you know, coming up with a new product or a new technology, a new service, or is it more along the lines of introducing new practices into the business, you know, talking differently with the business, monetizing on some of the services? Like, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of, of everything. In the, 
as these APT groups continue to get more and more sophisticated, uh, successful cyber organizations are going to have to stay agile and nimble, paying attention to the landscape and, and not just be stuck that the tools of three years ago are the tools that I'm going to stay with, right? There may be better tools out there. And so looking over the, 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 the uh, capability landscape every few years, I think, I think is prudent. We do a lot of, of red teaming, at least lately in the last year. Uh, to keep our, our our security team sharp and to to hone our incident response skills, so we we bring in external pen testers. We give them the keys to the kingdom. We pick 15 or so assets that we want them to do, and we give them a couple of weeks, and we let we basically play war games and let the SOC try to figure out what's happening and and, and defend against it. Now, you know they 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 go one step short of actually taking something down or whatnot, of course, because. We are a running enterprise, and we can't. They can't just do that. But but trying to play those games and, and trying to 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 really practice the skills that you need when something bad happens, because it's going to happen. If they if an APT group sets their sights on an organization, they'll find a way to get in. Our job is is not to so much to to keep them out, but to recognize it quickly and then take the proper steps. And just as a follow-up question here, so again, uh, going back to my years uh, working with some academic institutions, I remember there was uh, um, a tension always on between scientific freedom and the need to share data and information with other scientific uh, organizations uh, globally and, you know, the need to maintain control, access control, and information security. Like, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that tension has existed since the big dawn of, <laughs> of information and will continue to exist. I think the, uh, to be successful, we need number one for the scientific staff or research staff to, to be successful because we get paid to, uh, to do research, not to, uh, to do cyber. Cyber mm -hmm. is just required. So, so, it, so you, it just requires conversations. We, you want to share data with people that you want to share with, and you just set up systems so, so that they're able to share the kinds of data they want with the people they want, but with nobody else, if, if you will. And you, you make things, you, you, you know, it requires maybe a couple extra steps, but you don't, you don't lock things down so that they can't share data, but you don't open it up to the world so that anybody uh, can find it. And, and do things. So, so it's building that trust between the scientific staff and, and the cyber team, and then, uh, and then, you know, having the, co the conversations on what, how valuable is the data and how protected does it need to be, if you will. But in your opinion, is that enforceable and, and can you govern it? Well, yeah, well, that's, those are two good questions. Is, we can certainly govern it, and if you're aware of it, you can enforce it. The, the tricky part always is to be that aware. you're, not, al you're yeah. not always aware of what's going on, especially in a large organization. And so you can get caught with your pants down, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, switching gears here, uh, I, I had a couple of questions about vendors. And again, uh, I'm sure you use vendors. I'm sure it's not as different uh, in the federal space uh, when you compare it to the civilian world. Uh, like, what is it that you don't like in a vendor, and what is it that you do like in a vendor? Uh, so let's see. So let's maybe what I don't like in well, what I don't like in a vendor is those that are just constantly barraging me with 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 uh, with stuff. But but let, let's take. I'd rather have this be a positive conversation than, than a negative one. So let me let me look at it from from the positive side. So so what I'm looking for with vendors are partnerships. I'm not looking for to just buy something and then they go away. I'm looking for a partnership, whether it be an EDR or, or, or whatever, an analytics package or whatnot, where I'm expecting us and them to mature together as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I want a vendor whose roadmap makes sense to me in terms of where they're heading, what their vision is for, for their technology. And, and one that's patient because unlike corporate America, we're not as flexible in terms of funding. And so it, we may start a conversation, uh, but it may take us 18 months to actually close the deal, you know, much longer than, than what the corporate space is used to. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. So, and in terms of uh, like 
communication. Is there any way that the vendor that that, you, that the vendor can communicate with you or reach out in a non-intrusive way? Uh, well, I don't know, non-intrusive. I mean, let me tell you, my experience is the following, is that I effectively never respond to vendor requests on LinkedIn chats or e e messaging, right? I just, I get bombarded with them there and uh, and I just don't have time to, to deal with it. So, so where the way I, I prefer, right, is is that they reach out via email, and they make it clear up front what their value proposition is. Now, the tricky thing is, you know, I have a certain size team, and so I can't go after every value proposition at once. So, so if the value proposition is sort of where I'm thinking about right now as to where we want to improve uh, or fix a gap or, or something, then I will probably reply. If it doesn't. If I don't reply, it doesn't mean that I hate them or I'm not interested per se. It just means that that's not where my focus is today and that they should reach back in four to six months kind of thing, because it, it may be a focus at that point. Mm -hmm. does, does that make it all sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. to each his own. And, you know, some people uh, want to uh, avoid getting too many emails. Other want to avoid uh, getting too many LinkedIn uh, messages, obviously. Uh, yeah. It's all good. Um, now, in terms of uh, people that have been influential to you in the cyberspace, I know you mentioned your brother who's at Berkshire Hathaway right now, I think you mentioned. Do you have yep. any other, uh, you know, key influencer that you look up to? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of people I've met on this cyber journey. Uh, Ed Vasco runs the Institute for Pervasive Cybersecurity at Boise State. Uh, Kim Jones, Jason Stead is the CISO at, at uh whatever quality hotel groups, I think. Anyway, they're, they're all very impressive in their own rights. And, and anytime I get a chance to interact with them, we, some, we have sort of quasi local meetings periodically. Uh, I always like to pick their brain and hear where their focus is. And they're kind mm -hmm. enough to, to share. The, the thing about cyber is it's, it's interesting. People that have made their career in it are very willing to give back to the community and to, to help and to try to bring others along in a way that I think lots of, of, uh, of communities doesn't have that kind of thing. So I'm always very impressed at, at people's willingness to, uh, to help uh, other people, bring people along, mentor, uh, guide them, coach them, answer questions, whatever. There's no, there's no uh, uh, sort of, what's the right word? Uh, competitive advantage in cybersecurity. Right, it's just something we all need to do. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've I've met a lot of uh, individuals in the last few years that are, as you said, willing to give back. Everybody wants to give back. Uh, consider this this place as a community. So that's actually a nice thing to have. Um, yeah. Now we're almost at the tail end of our podcast here. Uh, let me just ask you a one final question, which is more on a pay, on a on a personal note here if money was never an issue what would you do with your life huh. you know actually it's a strange question but exactly what I, what i'm doing now i i love what i do my my passion is the outdoors and so i spend a lot of my spare time fly fishing and bird hunting with my dogs and my wife and uh, and i get to, i'm right now i live in in idaho and montana which is great places if you want to do that and and I very much like what I do and, and would continue to do so. Okay. So that's not so different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good uh, answer. And then I think uh, I've, I've gotten that response a number of times already. So that's always, you know, good to see people that are actually enjoying what they do and wouldn't want right. to change it. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thank you again for taking the time, Rob. Uh, oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Uh, hosting you here and having this uh, little chat with you. Um, I, I hope your answers would resonate with our listeners and I'm sure everybody will be able to walk away with at least uh, one thing that they could go ahead and implement and, and take some value home with. Does that make sense? Well, thanks for your time and thanks for asking me. I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob.